Good evening, everybody. Everybody joining us here, everybody joining us online. My name is Father Andrew Summerson. On behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute, we want to welcome you this evening. Um, if I were God, and I were trying to narrate who I am to people through the scripture, the first line I would cut would be the book of Job. Yeah. Uh, because it indicts me rather cruelly uh, about who I could potentially be as the creator of all things. Uh, but luckily, uh, the early Christians uh, recognized that they have a much wiser creator than me. Uh, and so they recognized that in the depths of the tragedy of the book of Job uh, were something to be gleaned about the mystery of this existence that contains both the heights of our joys, but sort of the depths of all of our tragedies. So Paul Blowers is here to talk to you about that tonight uh, from his recent book. He is the Dean E. Walker Professor of Church History at Emmanuel Christian Seminary at Milligan University, and he is a noted scholar of patristics and early Christianity. He is the former president of the North American Patristics Society and associate editor of the Journal of Early Christian Studies. From 2017 to 2018, he was a Henry Luce Fellow in Theology, and among his other works, Paul has authored are Maximus the Confessor, Jesus Christ and the Transfiguration of the World, The Drama of the Divine Economy, Creator and Creation in Early Christian Theology and Piety, Exegesis and Spiritual Pedagogy, and Maximus the Confessor. He is the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Early Christian Biblical Interpretation and has two works of translations on early Christian texts, Moral Formation and the Virtuous Life in 2019 with Fortress, and On the Cosmic Mystery of Jesus Christ, Selected Writings of St. Maximus the Confessor. There's many articles throughout Journal of Early Christian Studies, Vigilia Christiane, Studia Patristica, Pro Ecclesia, Church History, Modern Theology, and Studies in Christian Ethics. He's edited and translated the Bible in Greek Christian Antiquity and was the genital editor of the Encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell Movement. His most recent book, Visions and Faces of the Tragic, The Mimesis of Tragedy, and the Folly of Salvation in Early Christian Literature forms the subject of tonight's lecture. So here to speak to us about negotiating tragedy and the tragic, discursive, performative, and interpretive strategies in late ancient Christian literature, uh, it's my pleasure to offer you my friend, esteemed colleague, Paul Blowers. So here you go. Thanks, everybody. When I left my hotel room, my hair was so neat and quaffed, and then I walked into the Windy City, and all that ended. So if I look disheveled, you understand why? You folks online are lucky that you're missing our horizontal rain and wind today. It's great to be here. It's great to be back with Andrew again, and um, I have appreciated from a distance the work of the Lumen Christi Institute for a long time, so it's great to be a part of this occasion. In his 1961 book, The Death of Tragedy, the esteemed literary critic George Steiner confidently declared that more than any single factor, the emergence and endurance of Christianity with its hopeful eschatological gospel and its refusal to countenance the victory of evil in creation accelerated the demise of tragedy as a competitive literary and dramatic art form. Steiner and like-minded critics have determined that Christianity has ultimately never been able to stomach the kind of reality that tragedy aspires to mimic, the reality of existential dead ends and of unspeakable, unfathomable, and uncompensated evils. In this lecture, I will enthusiastically beg to differ and suggest, on the contrary, that Christianity's critically constructive engagement with tragedy and the tragic took shape very early in its history. Admittedly, this engagement cannot be measured by an abundance of Christian tragedy writing, though remarkably, there were a few such works. In the fourth century, the bishop Apollinaris the Elder in Syria composed a tragedy based on Old Testament history all the way up to the time of King Saul, written in part to agitate against the Emperor Julian's ban on Christians teaching pagan classics. And in the eighth century, the monastic theologian John of Damascus is credited with a tragedy retelling the story of the martyr Susanna, 
But early Christian engagement with tragedy and the tragic is far broader in scope. At one level, as we'll see, it entails a discursive and rhetorical conversion, a gradual domestication of tragic language and imagery and Christian usage. At another level, it involved reimagining, excuse me, reimagining Christian's identity and performance in the world along the lines of entrance into human tragedy. The overarching hermeneutical challenge, however, was deciding whether tragic perspectives were discernible within the Bible itself, whether Christian's experience of the world could accommodate a tragic vision of things and whether such vision could be reconciled at all with deeply rooted convictions about divine providence, justice, and wisdom. Without question, the earliest Christian encounter with the tragic poetics of the Greco-Roman tradition was negative through and through. Tertullian, in his famous treatise De Spectaculis on the shows, written around 198, he assailed all manner of pagan spectacle and its power to fixate and to seduce the soul into a whole contagion of vile emotions. In the view of him and other polemicists, Christian audiences were not capable of vetting the panoply of passions cultivated by circuses and stage plays alike. Wittingly or unwittingly, these critics carried forward Plato's extensive rebuke of the poets, especially the trag tragedians, as traffickers in raw emotion and nemeses of the quest for true philosophy. At the front end of the new Con Constantinian regime, however, this, this polemic began to ease a bit. The African apologist Lactantius, who castigated pagan comedy and tragedy alike for its moral bankruptcy, nonetheless conceded that, quote, no poetical work is a total fiction, unquote. And he attributed to Euripides, no less, the wise aphorism that, quote, what here are thought ills are in heaven goods, unquote. Eusebius of Caesarea, for his part, blasted the trage tragedians using Plato's censures, and yet allowed that they were theologians of a sort. He also copiously cited Clement of Alexandria's earlier work identifying the tragedian's many uh, redeemable insights. Later in the fourth century, John Chrysostom and other homilists would open wide the door of their preaching to tragic language and imagery, confident that tragedy and the tragic had been sufficiently domesticated for Christian edification. This discursive shift belongs to what Averill Cameron and others have identified as a broad transformation of Christian rhetoric in late antiquity, as Christian authors now look to cultivate their own literary classics and to bend older pagan art forms to their own advantage. But, that tra but the tragedy should still make the cut is rather striking. In my judgment, there are two primary reasons it did. One was the strategic recognition by Christian intellectuals that tragedy had endured in pagan cultures because it was a powerful medium for public reflection on divinity, humanity, evil, suffering, and destiny. Even Plato had observed that philosophers were far more effective at composing real tragedy than the tragic poets. And such eminent Roman thinkers as Cicero and Seneca already redeemed elements of tragedy in their own philosophical writings. Another factor conducive to Christian co-opting of tragedy was the fact that by the fourth century, tragedy had increasingly drifted from actual staged performance to rhetorical recitation and to stock material for mimes and dancers. Certainly there were no early Christian treatises on how to revamp tragedy for Christian usage. The mimesis of tragedy was woven into multiple literary genres and was often more subtle than spectacular, but incisive nonetheless. It appears in the exegesis of a wide array of biblical texts, beginning with Adam and Eve's transgression in Genesis 3 and the mass of provocative questions that that generated, various patristic interpreters from the Syriac East to the Latin West discerned in the fall narrative the very elements 
that Aristotle and his poetics had identified as essential to effective tragedy. Characters making catastrophic miscalculations. Experiencing a fateful reversal of fortune and coming to a profound recognition of their deed with an accompanying pathos of epic proportions. Atop all of this was the fateful theological question. How could creatures made in the image of God and dwelling in sublime communion with God ever manage to embrace evil masquerading as a good? Created by a perfect and benevolent deity, how could they ever elicit pride, envy, self-love, or other vices that early Christian expositors selected as the primal vice in the garden, the signature tragic flaw of the human race? Here was the tip of a massive interpretive iceberg. And while Christian exegetes in their tragic mimetics were attuned to the conventions of the classical tragedians, their greater concern was to imitate the tragic perspective they beheld within the biblical sources themselves. The Old Testament paraded before their eyes an array of tragic figures, heroic and villainous or somewhere in between. And patristic interpreters exposed their tragic features in kind. Here's a few examples. Cain, who was admonished about performing well and avoiding evil only after God had already rejected his sacrifice, prompting an unbridled envy of Abel leading to fratricide. The falling out led one Syriac Christian poet to write an entire tragic dialogue between Abel and Cain, a pathos-laden exchange over their disastrous sibling rivalry, which John Chrysostom compared to the rivalry of Oedipus's sons, Eteocles and Polynices, in tragedies composed by Aeschylus and Sophocles. The patriarch Jacob, the mama's boy, who seemed as much a subject of comedy as of tragedy, and whose antics turned his brother Esau, whom God allegedly hated, according to Malachi 1.3 and Romans 9.13, into a better candidate as a tragic hero of the story. The mercenary Jephthah in Judges chapter 11, a man on whom the spirit of the Lord had allegedly landed, and whose seemingly pious vow to God to sacrifice the first thing that came through the front door of his house after returning victorious over the Ammonites, blew up in his face when that thing turned out to be his daughter, his only child. As Ambrose of Milan describes it, Jephthah imposed on himself a pitiable necessity, a tragic point of no return. An ancient exegete struggled to squeeze sense out of its senseless death. King Saul a classic case study of a king so very promising on whom the spirit of God had again rested and yet who was undone by fatal flaws, in this case envy and jealousy toward the upstart David leading to, slow, to Saul's slow self-destruction, a story that prompted three homilies from John Chrysostom exploring Saul's invidious passions. And here we go, Andrew, Job, the victim of a wager between God and Satan pressed by his devastation to curse the very day he was born and further tortured by the jaded theodicies of his three comforters. The Antiochian exegete Theodore of Mopsuestia was so repulsed by Job's likeness to Greek tragedy that he rejected the book's canonical status, earning him a condemnation by the Council of Constantinople of 553 additional to his alleged Christological errors. All these were further matched in early Christian exegesis by the tragic figures and episodes of the New Testament. King Herod and the Holy Innocents. Another villainous king assuaging his envy and jealousy by snuffing out the lives of baby boys in his domain, turning them into proto-martyrs without their even knowing it. Christian preachers used rhetorical ekphrasis, vivid description, to play up the tragedy all the more. 
such as in this very moving passage from Basil of Seleucia. Listen to this. For me, the infant's cries still echo all around, and I have imagined watching them, these babes wailing indiscriminately with terror as they saw the gleaming of the swords and turned in panic to their mother's arms for safety, then sank into their bosoms. I consider, too, the mothers themselves looking on, one here and another there, passing through the city with their piteous and precious cargo, seeking a place of refuge, and not even receiving a decent veil over their eyes when the dagger reached its peak. I think of one mother trying to escape and casting herself into totally unfamiliar courses of action. Still another mother I see vainly flinging her hair over her child, hoping by such modest camouflage to steal him away from the danger. Yet another mother I imagine being violently cornered by her pursuers, then withdrawing and being stricken with fear and crying her eyes out and gazing at the flashing sword, dividing her tension between the sword's forward motion and her baby boy about to be hacked and instinctively insinuating herself between the weapon and the child she holds. In addition, I see another mother able neither to move nor to exhale even a little frozen in her tracks by terror, having already consumed herself with a parent's proper fear and awaiting with faint wailing the smiting sword. Then there was the strangely tragic figure of John the Baptist, a man whose very calling was to decrease, to be eclipsed, to have his brief moment on the stage of salvation history before vanishing completely from the New Testament. A liminal figure caught in the fray of the violent dispensational transition from law to gospel. Peter Chrysologus, the Italian Bishop of Ravenna, describes John's beheading as a theatrical fiasco at a pagan dinner party, quote, a house is transformed into an arena. The table turns into a theater. Dinner guests become spectators. A banquet is turned into frenzy. A meal becomes carnage. Wine changes to blood. A funeral is held on a birthday. To mark one person's beginning is another person's ending. A banquet morphs into a murder scene. Musical instruments ring out. A tragedy for the ages, unquote. Then, of course, there's the tragic villain, villain, Judas Iscariot, nicknamed, of course, in John's gospel, the son of perdition. Leaving patristic interpreters speculating on whether, God forbid, he had been in some way divinely predestined to his betrayal of Jesus and to his mock repentance. Hilary of Poitiers proposed that before his last breath on the cross, Jesus let out an anguished gasp over the fact that he, his death would cover all sins except that of Judas. Even the hopeful origin refused to speculate about Judas's inclusion in the final restoration of all things. And finally, there were the tragic villains Ananias and Sapphira in the primitive Jerusalem church who abruptly dropped dead, you'll remember, under Peter's accusation that they had held back some funds from the church. On this story, the apologist Macarius Magnus in the fourth century had to stave off the devastating criticism of a philosopher, probably Porphyry of Tyre, that these miraculous executions represented an outrageous divine injustice, the punishment hardly matching the crime, with the incrimination coming hypocritically from Peter the very man accused of the far more egregious act of denying Jesus three times. Taken together, these biblical episodes elicited different types of tragic circumstances, indicating the need for flexibility in what qualified as genuinely tragic. Reversal of fortune, painful discovery, were just too obtruse in stories like those of Adam and Eve in the garden, or Jephthah and his daughter's sacrifice, or Esau with the loss of his birthright, or the material and spiritual devastation of Job 
Patristic commentators cultivated unmistakable profiles of the tragic he hero with a fateful flaw, King Saul in particular, the tragic villain or antagonist Cain and Judas Iscariot, but more ambiguous profiles, characters not easily or precisely fitted into heroic or villainous molds like Adam and Eve and Esau and Jephthah. There are also the silent victims of injustice denied the chance to speak up in defiance. Jephthah's daughter, Job's children, the holy innocents. There are casualties of the greater good destined to fade from the scene, such as Esau superseded by Jacob or in quite different circumstances, John the Baptist eclipsed by Jesus. Furthermore, there are the appearances of fatalism or something close to it. God hating Esau? Or Judas Iscariot being a marked man seemingly before he was even born? In effect, some patristic interpreters could have sympathized with George Steiner's assertion that ancient tragedy was at bottom an enacting, testing of theodicy. While fiercely devoted to the doctrine of divine providence, many Christian interpreters balking at exegetical naivete assumed there were deeper reasons for laboring to reconcile these narratives with divine justice. Certainly one strategy was to remove the scandal through figural or allegorical interpretation, such as when Augustine removes Jacob and Esau to the level of the soteriological and eschatological typologies, or even more dramatically, when the Syriac authors Afrahat the Persian and Jacob of Sarug both deduce that Jephthah deliberately sacrificed his daughter as a type of Christ's future sacrifice. But another and more intriguing strategy was to enhance the tragedy in these narratives all the more, to flirt rhetorically with fate, to allow Christian audiences to visit the cul-de-sac of unresolved or ostensibly senseless evils, existential dead ends and to bring them to the theological precipice, as it were. And yet biblical interpretation was only one, albeit foundational, medium of tragic mimetics in late ancient Christian writing. Also compelling was the literary and rhetorical reinvention of the Christian self as a tragic self. That is, a human subject self-conscious of being locked in an antecedent condition of creaturely finitude, vanity, or sinfulness, a self that is both actor and chorus, as it were, for its own tragedies, able also to exemplify the catharsis of a full spectrum of tragic emotions, from fear to grief to despair to hope. Not surprisingly, the most lucid profiles of the tragic Christian self appear in autobiographical works and in letters. The prime example from Christian antiquity, no doubt, is the rich and extensive autobiographical poetry of the Cappadocian bishop Gregory Nazianzen, who serves as his own tragedian, dramaturge, messenger of bad tidings, all wrapped in one, and rescripts his entire episcopal career as a series of reversals of fortune and horrific discoveries. Tragedy for him is simply the only poetic or rhetorical medium that can adequately communicate the immensity of his twists of fortune, his near-death experience of a horrific storm at sea, which of course was a familiar theme in Greek epic and tragedy. The vicissitudes of life that landed him in an ordained ministry against his will the egregious villainies of betrayal by his episcopal rival Maximus the Cynic and others, the crisis of his short patriarchal tenure in Constantinople, and lastly, the bodily illness that left him dubbing himself a living corpse. And by the way, his entire great autobiographical poem on his life is composed in tragic meter, which is interesting. His personal tragedy is made a comedy by his enemies, he says. 
His multiple discoveries of his tragic saga are not just grueling experiences, they are apocalypses about the world, human nature, and the fragility of relationships and friendships even in the church, especially in the church. Along the way, Gregory displays a veritable whirlwind of emotions, some of them seemingly contradictory and difficult to sort out, sanctimoniousness, compunction, indignation, dejection, confidence, pride, desire, guilt, fear, bereavement, vindication, pity, and a panoply of others. But at the center of this vortex is an equally passionate theological reasoning as he ponders how divine providence is still operative in his, in his own affairs. Meanwhile, Gregory holds up the pro profile of the tragic Christian self as not his alone. His personal passion play is but an epitome of the historic struggle of the Christian communion and its Trinitarian faith in the face of manifold antagonists. Christians of all walks of life share in the same struggle with destabilizing forces operative at the level of one's family, community, the church itself, and of course even the cosmos as a whole where the creator perennially appears to be taming and reordering resurgent chaos. In the confessions, by contrast, you're probably a little more familiar with the confessions, Augustine is not nearly so explicit as Gregory in depicting his life as tragic, though subtly it is there. In the beginning of book three, he admits to having loved absolutely loved watching tragic plays in Carthage during his student days because he enjoyed bawling his eyes out with pity over the characters on stage only to chastise such behavior as self-indulgent emotional voyeurism. Why squander tears on fake stories and fake characters when one's pity should rather be turned to human beings reveling in their sin. And he probably has himself in mind there. And yet Augustine is confessing to having been just such a reveler, of course. The dilemma of the tragic self for Augustine is tied up with the very possibility of even having a self at all, a definitive identity in God. Scholars continue to debate this very problem. John Cavadini, for example, argues that the Augustinian self is characteristic, characteristically and perennially elusive. Charles Taylor suggests that Augustine self anticipates the self-reflective self Cartesian ego. And Chicago's own Jean-Luc Marion proposes that for Augustine the self is less a being, ontologically speaking, than a pure divine gift, something confessed rather than known. And yet Augustine still seems to strive after self-knowledge and self-possession. As he states in De Trinitate, the soul being present to itself already knows itself so long as it is in its godlike simplicity, true to itself as the image of God, true to its true love, God, and not distracted by ulterior loves, ulterior knowings, which invariably pervert its innocent self-knowledge. But it is already primordially a broken quest, hampered by the inherited flaw of original sin, which enhances Augustine's saga of the tragic self all the more, caught inescapably within what he calls the mass of perdition. Original sin carries its own inevitability and even in his own terms, necessitas, an alien possession and obsession. Quote, the self which willed to serve was identical with the self which was unwilling. It was I, unquote. That's not all, however. This crisis of the tragic self is further tied to what Augustine describes intimately in the Confessions as the dissension, distension of his soul in time. The incapacity of the self to achieve stability in an abidingly secure present because it is constantly being stretched and fragmented across past, present, and future 
constantly having its identity eroded. Quote, you, O God, are my eternal father, but I am scattered in times whose order I do not understand. The storms of incoherent events tear to pieces my thoughts, the inmost entrails of my soul, until that day when, purified and molten by the fire of your love, I will flow together to merge into you, unquote. The distensio animi is descriptively crucial for Augustine's tragic self, since it combines, on the one hand, the ontological dilemma of the pilgrim soul's embodiment, its life within time-bound material flesh, which is at once a foreign land and yet a providential home, and on the other hand, the irreversible descendants of the soul from the fallen Adam. And yet this is precisely the stormy theater in which the gratuity of divine love and re the reintegrating power of divine grace come to be revealed. Let me turn now from the introspective to the extrospective for a moment, to the performative dimensions of the mimesis of tragedy, the cultivation of what I like to call a tragic conscience, which curbed any temptation to glamorize Christian existence as a path to transcendence wholly detached from the failings and calamities affecting all mortals. Christian preachers and teachers increasingly looked not just to speak of human futility and suffering in the abstract, but to challenge the Christian moral conscience by targeting specific social groups whose faces and bodies bespoke unrelenting tragedy. For example, the indigent and diseased, who were so often objects more of scorn than effusive pity in Roman society. They were regularly held up in the preaching of the Cappadocian Fathers and John Chrysostom. But less as purely the victims of socioeconomic injustice than as lead players enacting an unfolding tragedy in which healthy Christians were invariably implicated. In his famous oration 14 on the love of the poor, Gregory Nazianzen portrays the indigent as superstars in the drama of the precariousness of embodiment. Lepers in particular, victims of what he calls the sacred disease, are eminently tragic figures and worthy of tragic pity because they have known good health and then fallen from it precipitously, being betrayed by the body itself they are, he says, a dreadful and pathetic sight. Get this, the pitiful wreckage of what had once been human beings. And the only people in the world who hate and feel pity for themselves at the same time. Unquote. Gregory of Nyssa portrays them as actors in the theater of the grotesque. Quote, poets of a new and ill-fated tragedy they use no alternative tragic themes to evoke emotion, but fill up the stage with their own woes." Unquote. John Chrysostom's preaching focuses substantially on another group of tragic characters in Roman society, social parasites, persons who lived constantly on the verge of poverty or already in its grip. Parasites and flatterers were stock characters in ancient comedy. But real life parasites showed up at and were often hired entertainment for dinner parties, including the dinner parties of well-to-do Christians. Beneath a parasite's theatrical antics, however, lay desperate de dependence on a patron who could buy the person another day's survival. As exploiter, the parasite was an object paradoxically of admiration and of loathing, but as exploited, Chrysostom opens up the possibility in his sermons of considering the comedic parasite a marginal, but in the end, utterly tragic figure, worthy of mercy and even rehabilitation. In fact, in his sermon, he says, one of his sermons, he says, you should have nothing to do with parasites. Don't be around these fools. Don't invite them to your parties. It's a mockery. 
And he turns right around and says, by the way, you should bring these people into your home and hire them. Rehabilitate them. Let them teach your children. Interesting turn on Christensen's part. Probably more astonishing to modern observers is the way that married couples and ascetics and monastics were also reimagined as tragic figures. Two Cappadocian Gregories picking up on Paul's concern that marriage necessarily binds couples to quote unquote carnal affliction, although that's the, 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 the RSV translates that worldly troubles, but it's really carnal affliction in the Greek. The two Cappadocians began to apply the language of tragedy to marriage with the larger context, within the larger context of the economy of salvation. Gregory Nazianzen upholds the good of marriage, but also recalls, and he's, these are his words, it's comedy and tragedy, it's widowhoods, orphanhoods, untimely deaths, the cries of lamentation following upon the applause, the funerals following upon the weddings, the cases of childlessness and of vile children and of imperfect and motherless children, unquote. Gregory Nyssa likewise defends the dignity of marriage, but portrays its woes even more graphically and as one who was himself apparently married. Where, Gregory asks, is one even to begin worthily describing this oppressive way of life in tragic terms? Marriage seems so promising with its prospect of mutual affection, but quickly it bogs down. Matrimonial virtues, including what he calls the sweet rivalry of two spouses, taming their self-will through reciprocal love, falls victim to being the object of other people's envy. The wilting flower of marital bliss intensifies as does the anxiety of a sudden reversal of fortune. The joy of childbirth is compromised by gripping fear of the mother's death. And when this happens, the husband is left with an even more bitter tragedy as he cannot endure the extreme loss. As in Nazianz and the pros prospects of orphanhood, widowhood, and troubled children also appear on the horizon. Quote, all else aside, contemplate the tragedies on life's current stage and you will find that marriage is for human beings their chorus master." Unquote. The burgeoning forms of Christian asceticism and monasticism in late antiquity carried with them an entire array of dramas of bodily performance. But the plot often entailed the enactment of a reversal of fortune, which though voluntarily adopted through the embrace of poverty and detachment from all worldly security, carried a deeper message for the Christian public. Christians later, centuries later, excuse me, centuries later in his little book, The Birth of Tragedy in 1872, Friedrich Nietzsche mocked early Christian ascetics for what he called their burlesque antics, which along with their dreamy vision of heavenly rewards constituted the very antithesis of authentic tragedy. Interesting, isn't it? Early on, however, the perception was that these ascetics and monks dramatized Christian life intrinsically as an exile in the world and as a slow death to self. The so-called holy fools in particular, such as Abraham of Kedun in the Syriac tradition or Simeon of Edessa, were interpreted by their hagiographers as tragic characters in comedic disguise, boldly parodying the vanity and fallenness of the human life and culture at the dawn of the eschatological age. In Shakespeare's terms, Theirs was classic comical tragedy. Switching gears, one final group of tragic figures in the Christian foreground needs a descriptive category all its own, the so-called unbelieving Jews, whose perceived tragedy factored profoundly into the very shaping of Christian identity in the early centuries. Once the elect people of God, the Jews' reversal of, reversal of fortune, 
signaled by the destruction of the temple and another mass diaspora, was, for their Christian critics, the function of a catastrophic miscalculation, the rejection, of course, of Jesus as the Messiah and, and their accessory role in his death. But it was not just current events that told the tale. Eusebius Chrysostom and the Egyptian monastic author Isidore of Pelusium all draw on Josephus' own portrait of the Jews' tragedy in his work, The Jewish War, which graphically includes the story of a desperate Jewish mother named Maria, who amid the starvation attending the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, roasted and ate half of her infant son's body and offered the rest to Roman invaders repulsed by her offer. Chrysostom's homilies against the Judaizers are notoriously teeming with tragic imagery. While Isidora Pelusium refers to the Jews' constraint under a fateful necessity, Ananki. And yet, these and other Christian polemicists found themselves constrained by Paul's more hopeful scenario for unbelieving Jews in Romans 9 to 11 refusing to close the curtain on their sacred history and future, all the more so since it was intrinsically bound up with the salvation of the Gentiles. Meanwhile, the cultivation of a tragic conscience demanded hard disciplining of Christians' moral vision, training them to withhold judgment on who deserves what in life to refrain from overly simplistic rationalizations of God's ways and to meet the victims of all manner of tragedy, self-imposed or not, at the ground zero of human vulnerability. As conscience, it entailed deep moral self-awareness, but as tragic conscience, it was cleansed as a conscience only by coming to realize the self as bound up with the human other. Christian or not, in the same vanity, as Paul calls it in Romans 8. And so too in the same susceptibility, the same possibility of disorientation and despair. Such a conscience would not be cleansed save by an overhaul and transformation of moral intelligence and especially the moral intelligence of the human emotions at play in encounter with the tragic. You may remember that Aristotle identified fear and pity as the primary tragic emotions expressed through identification with the tragedy's characters even though the same emotions are in play in real life, where we fear for ourselves when someone much like us experiences suffering because it's too close for comfort. And we pity them when we deem that, that suffering undeserved. Scholars continue to debate whether Aristotle's catharsis of these emotions was aimed primarily at ventilating them or morally educating them. But late ancient Christian moralists were fairly unanimous that these powerful emotions needed to be used virtuously. They must take on what Robert Castor in classical studies identifies as healthy emotional scripts that serve purposeful moral ends. Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and their monastic devotees recognize in fear a selfish emotion by default that has to be thoroughly recontextualized. Its matrix must rather be that fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, as well as that fear and trembling, which in Paul's words are basic to salvation. Reverent fear of God relativizes transient fears of suffering, refocuses the Christian on what is truly desirable, since, as the Johannine writer says in 1 John 4.18, perfect love casts out fear. For Clement, Christians must therefore be a prudent phobic whose fear, thus rescripted, renders her more able, more ably disposed to face her own tragedy or that of others. 
Pity posed its own problems for Christian reinvention, since for the most part, in pagan moral culture, it was not considered intrinsically virtuous at all. Plato had considered tragic pity a sham emotion, while the Stoic Seneca tagged pity as undermining moral resolve, rendering the soul weak. Augustine also emphasized, again from his own experience, that tragic pity could easily dissolve into emotional voyeurism and self-indulgence. Pity, as Basil of Caesarea observed, could also morph into purely condescending pity, accentuating rather than closing the distance between the pitier and the pitied. The challenge for early Christian moralists was to re-script tragic pity as the Christian mercy already so profusely attested in scripture. John Chrysostom, for example, advised against Christians holding their own virtual inquisitions on who and who did not deserve mercy. The moral intelligence of mercy lay in strategically crossing the gap between the bearer of mercy and the one shown mercy. In preaching on the poor and diseased, Gregory Nazianzen and Gregory Nyssa discreetly negotiated the fine rhetorical line between pulling the, the, the suffering too close to their audiences, which might cause them to withdraw in horror, and guiding them across the existential divide, stretching their moral imaginations and pressing them toward genuine empathy in the presence of people whose broken bodies were sacraments of the merciful Christ. Late ancient Christian moralists also expanded the repertoire of tragic emotions beyond Aristotle's restrictive pair of fear and pity. Indeed, they tracked a wide gamut of emotional scripts of grief and melancholy, grief already having been explored by the classical tragedians as the emotional equivalent of blunt force trauma. Grief, after all, was the emotion most immediately tied up with human finitude and with the specter of inexorable suffering and death. Grief accompanied human confrontation with irreversible loss, the built-in tragedy of life in the flesh. Perhaps no one in Christian antiquity explored the anatomy of grief with more depth as Gregory of Nyssa. While appreciating the role of grief over loss in helping Christians to clarify their true desires and aspirations beyond carnal existence, Gregory also recognized that in this, in, in his beatitude on those who mourn, that Christ was actually calling Christians to sustained grieving over the tragic condition of the human race, its loss of paradisiac beauty and relentless experience of what he calls the deceitfulness of life. For Gregory then, the second beatitude solicits not self-pity over loss, but a kind of deep and contemplative melancholy in solidarity with all humanity and all creation in their tragic subjection to vanity. Intensified all the more by the recognition that creation is intrinsically good and destined to transformation to an even greater glory. Such a mode of sorrow would thus be an imitation of or participation in Jesus' own lamentation over Jerusalem, a scriptural pericope which garnered substantial patristic interpretation since Jerusalem symbolized cosmic misery. So I close with a few comments on the theological valorization of tragical mimesis in these writers. I began the lecture observing George Steiner's claim that Christianity more than any other factor hastened the demise of tragedy as an art form. I hope I've proven that wrong. On the contrary, Christians were attuned to the tragic character of human existence. And the, mim the mimesis of tragedy appears in a variety of Christian rhetorical literary forms already expanding in the early Christian age. While certain contemporary theologians, such as David Bentley Hart and John Milbank, have mirrored Steiner's concern and disputed the usefulness of a tragic vision for Christian theology, others, such as Hans Urs von Balthasar and Donald McKinnon, and more recently Rowan Williams, have reasserted its in integral importance to Christians, Christianity's witness in the world. 
Williams rightly criticizes Steiner for setting a prohibitive standard by focusing on absolute tragedy in which human life is grimly depicted as victim to ontological unwantedness and dystopia from the outset. Even the classical tragedians did not strictly define the tragic or dictate the terms of tragic mimesis, despite certain consistent themes across their works. The survival of tragedy into the Roman age and well beyond it depended precisely on a relative plasticity of the, of the genre and on its resilience in challenging afresh the philosophers and the theologians. The survival of tragic mimesis as a Christian theological and hermeneutical art form, however, was due in no small measure to the perception that with the advent of Jesus Christ, real human tragedy had hardly abated. On the contrary, new tragedies accompanied the incarnation from the very outset as signaled by Herod's massacre of the Holy Innocents. Paul attested that the church was destined to abide still newer tragedies and crises. Like him, his fellow Christians would inevitably, as he says, be perplexed but not driven to despair by setbacks, reversals, and bitter sufferings. The apostle even declared that the creator had subjected the whole of creation, of course, implicating the church as well in that, to vanity or futility, thereby graphically conveying the tragic condition of the post-Lapsarian world in advance of the final bodily redemption of humanity. Christianity did not grant immunity from profound evil and suffering or from an existential collision with futility. The various modes of tragic mimesis that I have discussed served in the long run to suppress fervid eschatological triumphalism as well as any residual urge to treat the gospel purely as a world transcending gnosis. Christianity gained rather than lost theological credibility by embracing and even dramatizing instead of denying the ontological fragility of human existence, the ferocity or atrocity of the human encounter with multiform evil, and the paradoxical coexistence of helplessness and free will. In particular, Christianity gained from tackling head on the sheer intractability and irreversibility of much human suffering and loss. The fact that there is no observable calculus of cosmic justice it, came, it gained from testing its own theodicies and presumptiveness about divine providence, even though divine providence, wisdom, and justice remained non-negotiable articles of the faith. Indeed, some early Christian tragic visionaries flirted rhetorically with the power of necessity and fate, probably most famously Boethius in his Consolation of Philosophy in the 6th century. In the interest of identifying with what humans actually experience as the randomness of evil. Though numerous patristic treatises on divine providence appeared in late antiquity, tragic mimetics had the advantage with its rhetorical and dramatic artistry to grant Christian audiences more latitude to imagine a world in which the creator is not truly sovereign over evil and suffering, in short, a world seemingly fatally hopeless and yet a hopelessness already vanquished through the incarnation and passion of Jesus Christ. Early Christian tragic visionaries were, for various reasons, less inclined directly to identify Christ himself as the ultimate tragic hero, such as he is made out to be, for example, in von Baldassar's Theodramatics, where the Son of God is abandoned by the Father to the abyss of human vice and misery. But their strong sense was that Christ alone could inhabit that hopelessness and turn it inside out as an aberration. Indeed, the rhetorical inversion provided by tragic mimesis enhanced the unique character of the Christian hope. In pagan philosophical culture, hope was a thoroughly expendable emotion, an invitation to self-delusion. But for various early Christian exponents, Hope itself qualified paradoxically as a tragic emotion. An emotion cleansed, trained, and clarified precisely through the experience of the tragic. In some classical tragedy where hopelessness was often the norm, hope nonetheless often made a cameo appearance, even if only to be chastened or dashed. <laughs> 
In Christian tragic mimesis, hope made its appearance not as a psychological deus ex machina, nor as some heady optimism to win over the despairing soul. Rather, it served to cleanse or reframe fear, and much like properly modulated sorrow, it helped to clarify the Christian's ultimate desire or love. Augustine's hope is the classic example here. Emotionally, it was a sort of sublime desperation. It modulated his fear of the final and fatal fragmentation of his sinful self and refocused that fear on reverence for the pure gift of divine grace. And by its unique in relation with faith and love, the two other theological virtues, hope clarified and stabilized the Christian vision of an existence in which tragedy and new creation are perennially and mysteriously bound up with each other. Thank you. It strikes me that we're so often caught up in a vision of tragedy based on what we think is the paradigmatic tragedy. So whether it be Oedipus Rex for Aristotle or Antigone for Hegel, um, and that often leaves us with an understanding of tragedy as always ending poorly. And yet the last tragedy that Sophocles wrote uh, within that trinity of tragedies of Oedipus' family is the middle tragedy, Oedipus at Colonus, right. uh, that doesn't end at all yeah. uh, poorly, um, but instead with Oedipus, of course, uh, entering into a form of paradise disappearing, uh, the fates being reconciled with the city and themselves, uh, the Furies becoming yeah. future defenders of the indigent of a sort. Uh, uh, and so I wonder if you could just comment on what, uh, on that, uh, you've already commented on how scripture itself is the paradigmatic tragedy that's drawn upon for early Christians, but if you could just comment on how, uh, how uh, shifting our understanding of the paradigmatic tragedy that's a, it, it's, it, it, that's a, I mean, that's the million dollar question in some ways. Um, Terry Eagleton has a book on tragedy that brings up this problem. He also has an interesting kind of parallel book on hope. But his, he, says, he says in his book on tragedy, the only thing anybody can agree on is that it's usually a sad story. <laughs> you know? um, I, I think, I, I think the, for one thing, early Christians are picking up on, they've got to have some kind of guidelines and what they're looking to probably is Aristotle's poetics to give them some sense of what, what are, are kind of the indispensable elements of a, of a classical tragedy. Again, this you know, terrible downfall, the, well, the miscalculation, the downfall, the recognition. He also includes you know, a, a, a probable plot, a, a plausible plot you know, um, n no uh, overly spectacular visuals. You gotta compel people at the level of, of raw emotions and so forth. Um, and I think they, they, they've, they've, some of them have picked up on that. Um, I think what you have, and this is certainly the case by the, by the fourth century, is a sense that we don't have to worry any, um, anymore about tragedies that just continue to uh, uh, compel everyone with existential dead ends and, and horror, horrible circumstances and fallen heroes and so forth. That had its heyday and look, now it's not even being staged anymore, rarely staged, almost always just recited or danced or mimed, you know. Um, it's it's kind of dead in the water so we can kind of do what we want with it. I think, I think the, the prime thing for these Christian interpreters is that a, a real tragedy is something that really does call into question divine justice and wisdom and providence at a uncanny level where there are, it's just not clean. It's not, there's no compensation, there's, no, I mean, Jephthah's daughter's story is just kind of it. Maybe the most tragic story in the Bible. I mean, especially, it's made worse by the fact you know, that she submits and she's, 
you know, she's, she goes along with it so that the vow to God can be fulfilled. And, you know, she comes out looking very, very good. But he looks like a crud. And yet, <laughs> early Christian preachers are, are aware that Jephthah appears in the litany of saints in Hebrews chapter 11. You know, I remember thinking, what in the heck is he doing in there? You know, but I, you know, I guess it's the sense that he was well-intentioned originally or whatever. Uh, but it's just such a senseless, miserable, there's, there's no, again, like I like uh, Ryan Williams' phrase, there's no moral calculus in it. It's, a, it's, just, it's just a god-awful mess. And there are those in the Bible, and the Bible allows them to be there, and we would be totally irresponsible theologically and ex exegetically naive if we think we can just interpret everything figuratively and allegorically away. That happens. Some folks do that. But the stories themselves, at a certain level, don't allow that. You know? And my biggest disappointment, by the way, is with... I think you'd have to be a little bit disappointed overall with the patristic interpretation of Job because the, the weight of it is so much on this righteous Gentile who, who endured, you know, the, the, the image of the patient Job and so forth, when in fact he comes across as godless at points in his outrage. In fact, Theodore of Mopsuestia was accused not only of denying that, that Job was canonical, but one reason he, he said it, was, it should be the scriptures is because Job does nothing but badmouth God from beginning to end. You know? And um, Gregory, of, Gregory the Great in his Moralia on Job, he, 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 he does kind of say, okay, yeah, these, these comforters with their poor theodicies and their platitudes and their jaded you know, notions of things got it wrong. And, but, but, but basically... Their theology wasn't as bad as their lack of compassion for Job. You know, it was a pastoral failure. You know. um, but there are a few, at least, who recognize that in the, book, in the Old Testament, the book of Job is the single greatest assault on the Deuteronomistic doctrine of fair reward and punishment. You know. And um, so I think, I think the way I would describe it is that they don't, they don't feel any need to be dogmatic about what's, what is and isn't tragic. I think they're interested in, in, in simply identifying why is this such a troubling story and why does it have so much chaos in it and no compensation, as, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just piggybacking off that because uh, you brought up the book of Job and Mark Barrett asks online, uh, well, comments that Job's final chapter reminds me of Nahum Tate's revision of King Lear's horrific final scene, right? So it kind of takes the edge off it. Uh, what do you make of the last chapter of Job, the fact that it was written at all and that it was allowed to remain as the ending of the book? And maybe you can even speak to the Septuagint ending, uh, which uh, is read Good Friday in the Byzantine tradition, right? That uh, seems to maybe change the fate of Job's uh, and our reading of it. Yeah, of course, Hebrew Bible scholars think that the, the ending in the Hebrew text is, is added much later to give a nice spin to the, and to save the doctrine of retribution. <laughs> um, I, wow, that's a great question. Um, I haven't studied the Septuagint text of Job enough to, to make a really informed comment. What's interesting is that Jerome when he was translating the, uh, you know, the, the Old Testament. Of course, he thought that, that the Septuagint text of Job was pretty bad shape. But he also noticed that, that the whole middle section was in the meter of both, uh, or I guess it's in the meter of epic, um, which was as good as saying, wow, this looks like a pagan classic at a certain level. You know? um, I, my, my sense is that the real end of Job, of course, is, the, is, the, is Yahweh's speech, you know, and, and Job's quote-unquote repentance, um, which, unfortunately, patristic interpreters kind of take as just this nice 
hand slapping reminder, you, you do realize I'm creator and you do realize I'm provident, right? And, I, and he does. <laughs> uh, but all the, the tragedy is that, that, that no one steps forward to answer all the bad theodicy. You know, not that everything in that's wrong, I mean, we still default to principles of retribution, we still default to this notion of rehabilitative suffering and so on. But even Elihu, who I always call the uh, seminarian who doesn't have enough theology under his belt yet to kind of come through in the clutch, he doesn't come through in the clutch. He thinks he's going to, he's going to correct things, but he doesn't. You know, so it ends up being this kind of a um, abrupt end. It's a beautiful thing. The speeches of Yahweh are beautiful. I, actually, I did long, long ago, I did one of my doctoral studies exam questions on Jewish interpretation of Job from antiquity on. And I found Jewish interpretation much more compelling and interesting, you know. And particularly of the of Yahweh's speech at the end, which is, of course, uh, often the early Christians learned a lot from Jewish interpreters. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I think the real ending of the book is Yahweh's speech, and I think the whole last thing, whether in the Hebrew or the Septuagint, the whole last part is kind of a add-on. Yeah. We have a question from. Keegan Delport, and thanking you for your lecture. And in line with your expertise, your focus was on the reception of tragic mimesis within early Christianity. However, research of several historians shows the persistence of the reception of tragic themes throughout the Middle Ages and beyond. Mm -hmm. This raises the historical question of how something like the interpretation of George Steiner, Lawrence Michael, D.D. Raphael, became especially popular, particularly regarding the anti-tragic impulse of Christianity. Yes. So if you have any ideas why this reading became possible, especially in the light of the plethora of historical evidence that suggests a rather different conclusion, uh, could it be a reaction against Christian Platonism, may it link to Nietzsche at all? So maybe your thoughts on how the, Steiner became possible. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, for one thing, of course, Steiner didn't look through all these he doesn't do a history of Christian engagement with tragedy, you know, um, which I think is a kind of a tragic flaw in his study, <laughs> if, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, yeah, I think, I think he's looking at the big picture of things and, and the way that, yeah, you still got tragedy with Shakespeare, you still got some stuff, you know, you got Sartre, you've got, you know, no exit. Um, you know, obviously stuff like that is destined to be box office flops in our world, you know. Um, but I think, he, I think he is kind of um, taking that argument and running with it without looking back at everything that is there. there there's a book by, um, can't pull up his name, professor at UCLA who did a history of tragic ideas and so forth he almost totally skips over the early Christian period. He starts kind of into the Middle Ages and goes on from there. But um, Steiner, I, I find no real historical argument at all. You know, uh, it's just a sort of a intuition on his part. Um, and I think a failed intuition. And um, uh, not that, you know, uh, I mean, let me put it this way. I was really surprised when I started working on my book how few people paid really any attention to this. A, a few scholars talking about rhetorical, you know, interesting rhetorical things, use of ekphrosis and other things, and uh, occasional tr tragic themes coming up in various writers here and there, but not, no sustained study of it all. And um, so, yeah, I think... Um, I think there's much value to recovering the history of Christian engagement with the tragedy. I mean, the interesting thing to me, too, is that it, right now, just within the last 10 years, there's a whole new discussion of this stuff. Modern theology ran a whole issue a while back of um, responses to Rowan Williams' little book, The Tragic Imagination. It's just a teeny little book. 
it's got a lot in it, but it's a teeny little book. And it, it was immediately polarizing, you know. Um, and, um, but most of the people who wrote for it, who wrote responses, including David Bentley Hart, which I was a little bit surprised about, you know, he's, he's going completely with a kind of contemporary theological argument without any reference to how this stuff has been engaged, you know, long before the modern period. You know, so, um, so there's real, there's real, I think there's real stuff to be gained by, by um, informing the contemporary conversation with, with this historical evidence, you know. So. Just one more question since you mentioned Terry Eagleton. <laughs> uh, Stephen Streed wants to know, if you find yourself ultimately in sympathy with the crucifixion as a tragic event and a great tragic spectacle at the same time, and maybe you want to unpack that all. Oh man, it's huge, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah that's huge. I, I kind of step around it because um, the, the you know early Christian writers were pretty intent not to cr treat Christ as a tragic figure himself. Um, there was famously a a work called the Christus Patien, which um, was a cento, you know, a take, taking of of stealing of lines from uh, somebody else's work. In this case, I think, whoops, in this case, I think it was Euripides, um, and putting together then a whole narrative, a whole other narrative, you know. And um, the, the, um, now I lost my, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? <laughs> tragedy, Christus tragedy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Christus Passion. Um, it, it, it builds the case with these lines from a, a great tragedy writer that Christ was himself a tragic figure and so forth. But that was proved to be like an 8th or ninth century text that had been ascribed to Gregory of Nazianzus wrongly, you know. Um, but the, um, there's a, there's, there's, there are real problems, obviously, um, in given the nature of Christological commitments and um, you know the whole the whole soteriological dimension of the cross and so forth. Very difficult to sort of cast it completely as just an awful bloody spectacle. Even though von Baldassar goes there too. You know, von Baldassar basically says that what we have in the cross is the father abandoning the son most catastrophically, you know, and um, might be pushing it too far for these ancient Christian writers, you know, and so yeah, it, it, that's going to come up in modern conversations. I don't think it ever does in the early Christian conversations. Finished? Yeah, well, I'd like to thank you again on behalf yeah. of everybody here. And Just a fantastic uh, lecture just to walk us through uh, both the Cook's tour of uh, the tragic, uh, the pathos uh, that we can all glean from this early Christian world as they look at the scripture. So we thank you again.